Good morning, everyone. Oh, yes, it does work without a microphone. It's technology. Hello. I'm Julia Mant. I'm uh, chairing this session. Um, the session that you're in is the Performing Archive. And, um, all right, now let's start because we've got a full session. Uh, first of all, uh, we have Kirsten Wright uh, giving a paper on exposition, counterpoint and recapitulation, the sonification of archives data. And Kirsten is currently her position as the program manager in the Find and Connect at the East Scholarship Research Centre at the University of Melbourne. However, she has a long time interest in music and it's on that subject that she's going to be talking today. So welcome, Kirsten. As more data of all types is available publicly, more people are looking to analyse and use this data for various work. And this is particularly the case for larger data sets, including so-called big data, which are not easily analysable or even understandable just by looking at the data. Um, and the visualising of data has certainly become a discipline even um, in its own right, and there are certainly like, specialists in that field. Archives data is no exception. And we have seen visualisations of archival holdings and series. Um, so this, the colourful one is Mitchell Whitelaw's Visible Archive Project. Um, Query Pick was built by Tim Sherritt to visualise results out of Trove. And at the East Scholarship Research Centre where I work, we have a tool that lets us visualise the data relating to all of our projects, um, which is also used as part of the logo for this conference. So we know that visualisations can be useful. Um, I decided one day um, it would be interesting to see um, if turning sound uh, data into sound would also be useful. So I decided to explore this. Put simply, the sonification, sorry, put simply, sonification is the acoustic representation of data. And it's another way to experience the data. Given that music is time bound, in that musical sounds progress over time, um, sonifications are well suited to data, which is also time bound. As mentioned, we're looking at representations of data through sound, so some examples. Um, at the most basic level, Things like heartbeat and other vital signs monitors are an example of sonification in that they're taking a particular data point and turning it into an oral representation of that. The reason I first had this thought was because I listened to a podcast which was about um, earthquakes in Oklahoma following um, the introdu introduction of fracking where they had a sonification of the frequency of earthquakes over time to show how they massively increased. Um, so these are sort of the, the sonification for um, data analysis purposes. Another example of that is uh, more recently there was an article or some articles about um, sonifications of the DNA genome. And that researcher has used this to be able to hear things like when mutations in the DNA occur and where there's gaps. Um, so again, that's that sort of data analysis um, purpose. At the other end of the scale, there are composers such as Brian Fu, who calls himself the data-driven DJ. He's combined various data and visuals to create pieces of music with accompanying visuals. Um, things like the differences in income mapped along New York subway routes and global movements of refugees over time. So why music, um, moving sort of beyond sound into music? Um, I couldn't help but put up a slide from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> Because I'm a geek, but also because um, I think music does enable us to think differently about data and how we interact with it and, or, and music. Um, and in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, music is the language that humans and aliens communicate with. Um, and I think it's an interesting thought to think about music and sound as abstract, not having any physical presence and the process that sort of unfolds over space and in time and then dissipating when it finishes. Um, Mike Rignetta, who I feel like all my quotes are from podcasts. I swear I actually did some reading about this as well. Um, but Mike Rignetta, who runs a podcast called Reasonably Sound, talks about sound by its essence being ephemeral. And I like the notion of that ephemerality or that um, abstractedness making the data more unusual or making the data more um, unknow not unknowable, but more um, alien to us, I guess. Um, sorry. So just wanted to run through a few tools that I looked at um, when um, considering how to sonify the data. 
Um, there are certainly others, and there are also quite a few online musical score composition tools, which I didn't really pay attention to. Um, so this first group of tools is tools that um, you input your data and the outputs have been pre-programmed. And there are quite a few sort of assumptions built into these tools. Um, so both uh, these tools I've mentioned here, the data sonifier and the sonification sandbox, are little pieces of software that you download onto your computer. Um, They're both developed by different universities in America and in um, Canada, actually. Um, you load your data in, usually in a CSV format or similar, and you map preloaded sounds available within the programs to different data points. Um, as I said, both make quite a few assumptions about um, what you want to do with that data or what you want to do with those sounds. Um, for example, the data sonifier um, was sort of de was developed out of a research project looking at mobile phone data. So they are making assumptions based on how big your time scale is. It's much more suited to hours and minutes than it is to years, for example. Um, each data point can be mapped to a specific sound. However, the programs only come with limited numbers of sounds and you can't add more of your own. So again, it sort of um, limits what you can do depending on what data you've got. It's also limited in their outputs in that you can't easily export the data to, or the um, resulting sound, I should say, to play outside the program. So the next step up is um, EarSketch. This was developed by the Georgia Institute of Technology. This is kind of a really cool tool because it's designed to teach you um, coding, either Python or JavaScript, through making music. Um, so it's online, you can create an account, you can save multiple songs. Um, as it is a teaching device, it does have tutorials built in as well. And it has audio tracks already in there and with much more flexibility about how you can use them. And then it also lets you upload your own tracks. Um, yeah, it also lets you sort of flick back between the different coding languages. So um, yeah, as again, as a teaching tool, it's kind of useful for that as well. And another step up from that, um, if you know how to code with Python, you can pre-program whatever you like and output it into Chuck, which is a programming language for, quote, real-time sound synthesis and music creation. So you do your coding in Python and then um, output it into Chuck, Chuck to create a sound output. Um, Chuck does much more than that, though. It, the emphasis is on real-time coding, so it also enables modification of code on the fly to create um, real-time interactive music. So it is used a lot by electronic musicians and artists. Another similar tool is Sonic Pi, which again uses with Python to create real-time modification and composition. So what did I do? So my day job, as Julia said, is to work on the Find and Connect web resource at the University of Melbourne. Um, for those who don't know about Find and Connect, it provides information about out-of-home care in Australia, 1850 to today, linking histories um, to records. Um, and let me just put in a plug for the web and mobile evaluation session tomorrow where we will be discussing Find and Connect in that context. Um, it's a massive site. We've got over 17,000 entries, including information about homes, institutions who provided out-of-home care, information about key events and legislation, information about the records, and information about the organisations who hold the records. Data is available in a few formats, including EAC, XML. So for this exercise, I looked at the information about institutions or homes that provided out-of-home care. So all institutions are given categories based on what type of home they are and, and how they ran. So for example, um, a Catholic orphanage, for example, or um, a government-run family home. We're able, to get, we're able to put on as many categories as is relevant to that particular home. Um, as I said, we've got a lot of data. So I narrowed it down just by looking at South Australia. I chose to look at South Australia because the history of out-of-home care means there's lots of different categories being used. Um, and the data spans the full time frame. So I looked at the home types. And for each institution, I, used, um, I took the first type category that had been assigned. Um, yeah, so I just looked, took the first ones. And then I mapped this out in a timeline. Um, you can't see that, you can't read all that, but basically this is a timeline of some of the homes, the categories, and then the, they start and end depend on, depending on how um, 
when the institution was created and how long it ran for before, before it shut. Um, I mapped these into five-year increments, so the scale at the top is in five-year increments, and then basically I turned that into sound. Um, so each five-year increment became one beat, and each home type, the children's home, orphanages, etc., um, was assigned a specific track or sound. And then based on the timeline, I could program it to tell it which track to start and end on. Oh, yeah, sorry. There's the timeline and then music tracks. Um, so hopefully this works. This is what it sounds like. Well, this is what I made it sound like. I'm not going to, it only goes for a minute, but you know. Um, so it sort of sounds a bit crazy. <laughs> um, I, well, I do actually, I do make comparisons between this and the history of out of home care in South Australia. Um, there's a total of 286 tracks in there because there were 286 <laughs> homes at that time during this time period. And despite only using one category per home, there are about 30 different categories in use as well. So there's a lot of different audio tracks being used. So we can narrow that down a bit, yep. Um, and let's take three of these categories. So I've got um, missions, children's homes, and convalescence homes, and put these together. So there's fewer tracks, and I have sped it up a bit, and I won't play the whole thing. So there's quite a lot of decisions and manipulations to go into this end result. Obviously the tempo and the overall feel of the piece, um, the tone and track selection can obviously have a massive impact on what the final result sounds like. So I will not play very much of this, but just to give you an example, here's the same three categories, but just with, uh, with different tracks. So we can make it sound quite different. Um, the data filtering, obviously, I had to d make a lot of decisions about what categories I wanted to focus on, um, what time periods, what state, etc. So depending on what data you're using, you may have to make more choices about what you hear and what you don't. The time scale, again, makes sounds very different if you speed it up or slow it down. Um, and there certainly have been recent articles about, you know, hear the music of the solar system, or this is what the solar system sounds like. And I would urge you to remember the amount of manipulation, maybe that's unfair, decision making that um, has to go into these, because it's not always clear. There's a quite a few, the authors are like, this is just what it sounds like, and without sort of going into detail. Um, but I would argue we need to consider these issues about uh, data visualizations as well. There are certainly some very effective data visualizations um, and certainly some less effective ones, and decisions need to be made about how individual data points are represented, what data isn't included, what data is not included, etc. Um, the programming historian, um, which is a great blog if you haven't seen it, has an article about sonification. And they say, quote, in sonifying data, I literally perform the past in the present. And so the assumptions and transformations I make are foregrounded. And that is what I like about that process, this process, in that it makes me explicitly think about the choices I'm making to display, or in this case here, the data. So to pivot a little, really quickly, um, congratulations. You have just attended the world premiere of my wonderful compositions, <laughs> South Australia Homes Categories, 1850 to 2015. Um, I do have some difficulties thinking of this as a, for me, thinking of this as, as a composition, given it doesn't feel like I made creative choices. Um, 
But I think it shows that sonification does blur the line or sits on the line between the direct analysis of the data and artistic interpretation of that same data. So is it music or is it just another way of interacting with the data and does that matter? Are these two things mutually exclusive? Um, there are certainly composers who use data sonification as a compositional method, including David Worrell and Milton Mermakaitis. Um, John Cage, most famous for writing a piece that's apparently about silence, 4 minutes 33, it's not actually about silence, it's about sort of the sounds that happen in the room while the piece is happening. And I think it's a really good or interesting example of the need for context around music and around composition and also around data and archives. Um, would my pieces, my compositions, be as interesting if you didn't know the context behind them? Probably not. Um, and to finish off, what I do think is interesting is about this process is to consider the use of constraints because of the data as a compositional device. Um, placing limits on what can potentially be composed means other creative thinking comes into play. So to finish, I do think there's a potential to be explored further with the sonification of data somewhere in that line of analysis and creative response. And I think it's also good, a good reminder of us to be sceptical or at least curious about what goes into other data analysis forms. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, yeah, sonification has the benefit of making data seem unfamiliar again. And I think that's good. That's me, please come and talk to me. Um, and I couldn't help but put up a visual representation of some sounds, again, from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. <laughs> Louise is a, a filmmaker and uh, archivist. She's completing a PhD, drawing on her work as a member of the Teaching and Learning Cinema Collective, uh, based in ACT and is on leave from her main job at uh, the National Archives of Australia. So welcome, Louise. Thanks. So the first thing I, I want to say is it's interesting, having listened to Vern's talk this morning and just hearing Kirsten, how it seems like there's a theme already, from my point of view, even though I was late to Vern's talk, sadly, which is that it seems like there's this moment where we're all trying to find ways to um, deal with different kinds of knowledge rather than the kind of uh, traditional knowledges that we're used to finding invisible traces. And I'm definitely tuning into that and the work I've been doing for the last couple of years is really looking at uh, how we can value uh, what's difficult to put into the archive. Um, so I've kind of been looking at this crossover point between um, knowledges of the body and what those of us who deal with the reality of archives and records face uh, when we try to put our heads around what those kinds of knowledge are and how we might bring them in or engage with them. Okay, so there's a little reflection. Um, so, yeah. So what I, my abstract promise is thinking through performance studies. Now, I'm not sure if there's any performance studies scholars here. I think I'm pretty safe to say there won't be, but there's someone. So that's really good, because hopefully I can get a bit of QA. Um, and I'm, I've become really interested in this discipline, uh, which is kind of the ultimate interdisciplinary discipline, uh, because it deals with disappearance. And so as an archivist, that feels like core business to me. Um, so the essence of my talk is some work by American scholar Rebecca Schneider. Um, she writes extensively about reenactment and a recurrent theme in her writing is her thoughts about archives. There's an axiom in performance studies that it's the study of twice performed behaviour. In theatre and other kinds of cultural performance, first comes a script experienced later by an audience as a performance. For Schneider, archives are less linear, but they have similar ingredients. The record captures a trace of a previous behaviour, and yet added to this is the future life of the record, that it will come alive again in a future time, in circulation. Archives hail a future time, a future reader, a future user. She comes to this through theatre studies and Gertrude Stein's axiom that theatre offers us an experience of syncopated time, because the time of the actors is different from the time of the audience. And I'm sure you can all reflect on the ways that those times in performance are different in multiple ways. 
Uh, Rebecca Schneider came to Melbourne last year here to Melbourne Uni and gave a keynote to a massive audience at the International Performance Studies some, um, Conference. And she talked a lot about how this interval between the time of the record and the time of its reception is critically productive. Um, a time for reflection, a time to choose how we respond to what has been laid down in the past. And uh, there's a couple of books that she's written. So her, her thoughts about this business of this critically productive time at the interval, um, she writes quite a lot about that in her little book, Theatre and History, which you can see up there. Um, and she talks a lot about how the archive is inflected throughout our present experience. And her question has been for some time, what is the time of the live act? Now you may be wondering, why is that relevant for archivists? And it's a lot to do with this question of the hail. What is the time of those archival records? And usually we think of it as a linear present and past. And what Rebecca Schneider is inviting us to do is to think a bit more in depth about that. And once we start doing that, we start to see that actually that question of time is not that simple because there's so many possible ways to read what the present is of those records. So we're gonna, rather than just leaving you with that brain teaser, I'm gonna hopefully talk you through this. Okay. So, and I think that this is really quite relevant for this particular conference because we're sort of trying to think anew about the legacy of actions in the past and the contribution archives make to that. And Schneider, for those of you who have poured over your Derrida, you'll see that she's quite informed by him because she's thinking about that future, that future question that the archive always poses. Um, so, and the other important thing is that, for her, it's always live because that's where we receive it. Now, there's quite a few theorists who've thought about, who've got this down, and one of the ones I really love is Brian Misumi, who talks about the analogue and how no matter how digital something is, ultimately it's analogue because we use our eyes and our ears or our hands or our bodies in order to receive it. And for those of you who heard me talk about these topics before, that's really the essence of my particular little corner of research, is I'm really interested in what it is that the body knows and how it is that we can somehow make that line up with what it is that the archive can tell us. Um, so as I say here, I've been puzzling over the link between reenactment and archives for some time, and Schneider's got this little phrase, histories of our re-encounters and the re-encounters of our histories and what we make of them. So from my point of view, to re-encounter, you've got to have something to re-encounter with. And this is the practical work of archivists, because let's face it, when you're confronted with the reality of stuff, it's stuff we have to deal with. We've got to decide what stuff it is we're going to get. We've got to decide how we're going to make it findable to somebody else. We've got to deal with the practical housekeeping of how are we going to actually put it into whatever it is we're going to put it into. And that problem, those problems apply. We have really... I'm still looking for someone to suggest some ways around those very practical problems. And that would have been my question to Vern had I uh, had the moment to grab the microphone. So um, we have to deal with that practical work. Um, and so, yeah, so we have to have something to, re to encounter with. And for me, uh, you know, that is archives. But through this work that I've been doing, my concept of archives has expanded to include ways of recalling behaviours, processes, structures composed in code. Okay, so this means I'm sort of taking one step back. So I'll just talk you through this now. So this means the record generating entities that allow the record to be performed. So my case study, the work I've, I've oh, done it again, I need this one. Uh, so the stuff that I have been looking at is performance art from the 1970s. And I've been looking at ways to try to keep this work alive. Now, you could just archive the original guy who made the work. You could just go ahead and get his work, uh, get a stand-in for him and deal with it that way. But what that's going to do is lock it in time. So here you start to get a feel for why Rebecca Schneider might be interesting. Because she's asking you to think about what is it you're going to lock in time? And is it relevant to lock it in time? Does that actually, is that the best record? So from a pure records perspective, thinking about ISO 15489 and its definition of a record, okay, what is, is, is that a full and complete, is that an accurate and reliable record? So 
in the work I've been doing, I have, we, I have taken a strategy of trying to create a kind of open text, if you like, the DNA, a, co a, a, a way of keeping alive that composition and code. So it's kind of taking one step back from the record and thinking, OK, so how can we seek to make some kind of way of keeping alive the thing that produced the record in the first place? So in a moment, I'm going to get onto databases, and that'll make a bit more sense. So what is inside this brochure that we, my colleagues and I produced as an attempt to try to do this capture of this 1970s performance artwork is this stuff. So it kind of goes into detail about what that, what that actually is. OK, so we're just back up here. All right. So, um, so what does Rebecca Schneider actually say about the record? So she joins into a decades-long discussion on performance studies about live performance. Um, and this argument says that for the live to remain, it must be recorded. And that what is live cannot, by definition, as live remain. Performance studies scholars don't like this because there's a quality to the experience of the live performance that they feel gets lost. So that's the problem of the complete and accurate record. For performance studies scholars, they feel like it's not complete and accurate enough because it doesn't actually capture the bit that they're interested in. So this whole thing gets quite complicated in performance studies, and we'll just skim over it. Um, but Schneider's specific contribution, which is the bit I really want you to try to take away, is to point out that the live performance itself can be a record. And this comes into play when we think of rituals and other activities that are composed in code, as Schneider describes them. And the example she uses is the liturgy. I'm going to talk you through the AFL grand final. Okay, so it's, you can get the picture. When you start thinking like that, you can think, okay, so the code is the ritual of the AFL grand final. And the game on Saturday between the Crows and the Tigers is going to be one specific instance of that composed and code structure of the AFL grand final. So you can see where she's going with that. And that's one way to counter disappearance. Because instead of thinking, OK, that grand final is going to disappear, which we all know it is, she's inviting us to think about that structure that created that thing and look at that particular instance, instantiation as a record in itself. Now, I really had hoped that I could really like nail this talk and tell you exactly why that is relevant to you. Sadly, I have not been able to make that crystallisation. But I do think that there's something deeply juicy in there. And if not the least juicy part, is it invites us all to look one step back at those bigger structures and to try to think about how we can make something fit for purpose from those for things that we want to keep. And it does invite us to start kind of thinking, OK, maybe that can't actually be a direct documentary something, because otherwise we get to the point where we have to archive everything. So these, these, these kind of, these seem relevant. So I've put here, why is this worth discussing with you? How does disappearance theory have merit for archivists? OK, and basically I'm saying what I've just said, because it's asking you, because performance studies points out this problem about whether a record can ever have validity in the first place. And so what, it, what this performance studies discussion does that is relevant for archivists is it just asks us, us to look at this age-old problem of what is a record and what is the boundary of the record through a different lens. And for me, that's a productive lens. And I think for some of you, it may be too. Um, so, and I've got here, you know, our discussion in this conference is diverse worlds, and for me that means diverse records. And we know these are a feature of our jobs, social media, databases, community archives that are conscientiously documenting actions with an eye to posterity. But we know that our core job is looking for essential recordness, and for me that's still authenticity and reliability, but as you can see, there's problems. So photography's got into this, and can a photograph actually be an index, and there's differences of opinions about that. Um, and here's my words about performance studies and that it's gone one step further and discussed whether that record can ever have validity or whether you just had to be there and that the performance must disappear. disappear. So the scholars went through this big long debate about whether or not performance can disappear starting in the early 90s. 
And it's really quite interesting. So orig the original words were from a woman, Peggy Phelan, who was trying to actually make a claim for the value of the immaterial. So that kind of connects with where I think we possibly are from the conversations I've heard in this room so far today. We're pondering how can we make valuable different kinds of knowledge from the physical traces that we usually experience. So Peggy Phelan's problem is kind of paralleled with our current situation. And when she was thinking about performance, she was actually saying, if you record something, it's not the same as the performance. And you could just say, duh, that's obviously the case. But um, it, it, it then, uh, hang on, we've gone too far. So, but of course, the reality, as we all experience, and as art historian Amelia Jones experienced, is that we wish, we need and want to have, we, we know the power of, of those traces. They're undeniably powerful. And it's not to say that they're not powerful. And Amelia Jones is trying to write the history of performance art. She's writing, started writing in the 80s, 90s. She was writing about work from the 60s and 70s. So she had nothing other that she could use than those traces. So she's saying, come on guys, let's get real. You know, the documentary trace stands. And she's making the case that there's no alternative. You, you recall knowledge from the past through this process of mediation, no matter what. So this gets to Rebecca Schneider's problem about liveness. You know, where is it? Where does it hide? Okay, and then a bit later on, Philip Oslander, he gives us this rundown about how basically live only comes into being as a concept because we record things. So that's kind of interesting. And then it's this whole effect of the economy of reproduction. That's getting a bit technical for our needs. And then we get to Schneider and she starts, she's getting into her argument about how the performance itself can be a record. And what I find really interesting is she just, in her, she works through Derrida and then she gets, gets onto the Greeks and she makes this point about how the first archives were mnemonics and they were mnemonics for performance. But the problem with making those mnemonics was that you split them off, you basically commoditize them. And so then, all of a sudden, the performance itself becomes less valuable because the mnemonic no longer stands in, it takes the place of that performance in the first place. And for me, I find that somehow deeply resonant with this moment we find ourselves in. From Schneider's work, in that article in 2001, Diana Taylor, another American performance studies scholar, she, she latched on to that idea as the archive and the repertoire. And she makes this binary between knowledges that last a really long time because they are in repertoire. And there's all kinds of scholars who've dealt with that. And one of my favorites is Robert Farris, Robert Farrah Thompson, Robert Farrah Thompson, who wrote this beautiful book called Tango, The Art History of Love, in which he really, really clearly sets out how transatlantic slave trade has brought these black traditions into the Americas that are absolutely resilient. And he calls it a charter of, what's his word? It's a charter of resilience, I think, is the word he uses for that. And so he's tracing really strongly that the repertoire is a very um, resilient archive. So I'm sure you, you can grab that concept. Um, so, and then here's Schneider's particular quote about this business of the record as a performance. So I'm running fast out of time, so I've talked to you briefly through the um, AFL grand final. Um, so just with the database, you know, the structure of the database goes through a set of pre-established processes, it performs. And that performance of the database spits out a particular output at that moment in time. And if we think of the live ritual like the AFL Grand Final, the algorithm of the AFL Grand Final plays out and the actions it spits out is a game we experience. There'll be material traces, video of the broadcast, football games, commentary, and these material traces are both records of the algorithm uh, of that particular game, but can they stand in for the whole algorithm? And performance study starts out by saying, no, the performance must disappear and that making a record is something different. It's not the final performance. Those material traces of the grand final are not the grand final. As, our, as archivists, we know this is true. We know if we have just the database output, we can't claim to have anything more than that. We can understand something about the database from the output, but we know we don't have the record of the database as such. 
And, you know, Amelia Jones concurred with this view that there are, there's merit in those traces. Um, and there's, there's nothing to say that that doesn't... Yeah, so where does that leave us? We agree there's merit to records and we know they can't stand in for the overarching structure that produced them. Um, so, uh, and if I think about my, my particular case, okay, so here we are with a woman with mirror piece, this 1970s artwork, it starts to bring questions like, where is the record in this work? So this is a, what you're looking at now is a reenactment uh, made in 2009 of this work from 1976. What do we do? Do we keep just the original artist's work? If we keep that, we'll know nothing of the later work as a reenactment. And interesting for what changes it makes to the original. So that's kind of talking to Kirsten's point about how she made all these choices, which in and of themselves could potentially be deeply interesting. I mean, in her case, she's done her work just now in order to show, to make a point. It's, it's not that she sat there and really analysed what kind of sound would be suitable for this particular set of records. But say she had, then all of a sudden that, as an interpretation on those original records, becomes kind of potentially really interesting. So do we archive, is it both? Is it the instructions of the artwork made by the reenactors? Okay, so here's my last thing. So if we think of things we want to keep that are composed in code, the repertoire is one way to do it, and viewing the performance as a record is one way of us help, helping us to see clearly what those composing structures are. So perhaps that's the best takeaway for you, is that through these ideas I've put before you, I hope you're going to take away this concept that we can think of that performance actually as a record. And what that helps us do is to surface what those bigger structures might be that produced that particular record and whether or not we should be turning our attention to those. Um, so that's a kind of really roundabout way of saying how we're going to archive the database. But anyway, <laughs> OK, thanks very much. So is uh, Stephanie Ferrara from the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. Her colleague Kelly MacDonald can't be here, so Stephanie's going to give the paper herself. And Stephanie is the coordinator of archives at the MCA. So if you could help me welcome Stephanie. Thank you. So recent years have seen the archival discipline reevaluate its focus to call for a disruption of hegemonic practices in favour of a plurality of perspectives. This conference has asked us to consider how diversity in our collections, profession and audiences might be put into practice. How do we open up to others to keep our collections relevant, meaningful and engaging? How can we be more inclusive to allow multiple voices and stories to be heard. One approach to the question of facilitating diversity is to recognise art's potential to open up a world beyond an empirical or manifest order of knowledge and to collaborate with artists. Cross-pollinations between art and archives abound, particularly in the last 30 years, reflecting the broader archival term occurring within the humanities and social sciences. There are many benefits to be found in such collaborations both the artist and institution involved. This paper will focus on how the Museum of Contemporary Art, the MCA, works with artists, and in particular, how this relationship facilitated diverse interpretations of archives during celebrations for the MCA's 25th birthday, birthday in November 2016. The MCA works from the position that artists, their works and ideas, provide unique insights into contemporary life. Artists at the heart. This is both a catch cry and a rallying call for the MCA. So as part of its birthday celebrations, the MCA commissioned six Australian artists to develop performative or participatory works that explored interrelationships between the past, present and future. Two of these works dealt directly with archives, as collections, as objects and importantly, as ideas to be mined or questioned. In her work, Narrow But Deep, Artist Jess Olivieri, alongside collaborators Mish Grigor and Lizzie Thompson, used objects from the MCA archives to examine the politics of retention, interpretation and public access. Lyndall Jones was invited to re-perform her work, Prediction 
Prediction Pieces number seven from the series The Prediction Pieces, using material from her original performance in 1984. Materials from the original performances of the prediction pieces are held by the MCA as part of its unique acquisitions program, the Contemporary Art Archive. Today's presentation will look at these two works in detail and the aims and objectives of the Contemporary Art Archive. We will unpack what these works and the MCA's acquisition strategies bring to interpretations, and co interpretations of and conversations about archival and museum collections their changing context and use. So before moving on to a discussion of these works, we will first look at the 25th birthday program in general and the curatorial approach <coughs> behind the performance program. Celebrations culminated in a three-day weekend of workshops, tours, performances, talks and exhibitions designed to showcase the best of the MCA across its 25-year history and to open up the institution to the visiting public. The curatorial program, developed by my colleague Kelly MacDonald, used performance as a vehicle to explore the MCA's history, to consider the present moment and the MCA's future, and the possibilities for art and museums more broadly. Along with Lyndall Jones and Jess Olivieri, other artists involved were Tesha Noble, Hussein Gamey, Lauren Brinkat and Brie Van Rack. Tesha Noble created a new work called Janus Machina, which used the double-headed figure of Janus, the Roman god of beginnings, endings, and transitions, as a basis for her performance. Noble's collaborator, Hope Hamey, breathed in the past and breathed out the future in a performance of beatboxing. Hamey manipulated her inhalations and exhalations into sound, audibly moving forward and reversing, playing with time and disrupting its linear nature. Hossein Gamey's work, Passing Within and Singing for New Stars, utilised vibrant costuming, choreography and ritual singing to create a ceremony to mourn the past and to welcome the future. Finally, Lauren Brinkat, in collaboration with Brie Van Rijk, developed a new work that acknowledged the lack of representation of women in many cultural institutions in the past and into the present day. They invited six female and one male drummer to literally make noise in the gallery and make their presence known. The drummers were sat at drum kits around the museum's collection galleries and played compositions by Brie Van Rijk. So I'll now just show you a sh very short video um, just to give you an idea of the weekend, what the weekend was like and what the performances involved. developed by Jones and Olivieri can be placed against a broader trope within contemporary art that has defined, examined, contested and reinvented notions about archives. 
Sue Brakel, Archivist and Senior Research Fellow at the University of Brighton Design Archives, suggests that similarities in practice, collecting, curating, arranging and engaging, can explain some of the mutual fascination occurring between archives and the visual arts. Parallels between the disciplines are also seen through, through the transformation of the archive from an object or repository to a process that can be questioned. In the visual arts, this transformation occurs quite literally, whereas for archivists, it is revealed in the way we think about, practice and teach archival science. Archives have become a rich site of inquiry and creative inspiration, informing the development and production of numerous artworks across a variety of media. So before opening to the public in November 1991, the MCA's chief curator, Bernice Murphy, alongside curator Sue Kramer, had begun developing the Contemporary Art Archive. The Contemporary Art Archive is a repository for the collateral produced by artists, artists in the making of their work and includes a documentation of performance. The Contemporary Art Archive facilitates the preservation of works and working practices or documentation of work that might otherwise no longer exist. According to Kramer, the Contemporary Art, em sorry, the Contemporary Art Archive emphasises through its collection and through its program the importance of original material by artists as being the best means by which to understand their work and ideas. The vision for this component of the MCA's collection is, it was incredibly forward thinking. In a letter to Lyndall Jones, uh, who's the artist we'll be looking at today, dated the 15th of February 1991, Kramer writes, the contemporary art archive should generate new work and ideas and be active rather than passive in its relationship with the future and the past. I'm interested in the idea that an archive can take many forms. From 1981 to 1991, Jones developed a series of 10 performances called the Prediction Pieces. These performances were multidisciplinary, time-based works which combined elements of theatre, music, visual arts, dance, photography and video. These works address the ways in which we predict and anticipate the future, how we think about it and the ways in which we might have agency over it. The MCA doesn't hold the performances that constituted the prediction pieces in its collection, though it does own the artist's archive of the work. The objects held in the contemporary art archive include the slides, props and costumes from the original performances. Kramer had asked Lyndall Jones to compile this collection for the MCA in 1991. Jones used what materials and objects were held in the Contemporary Art Archive to re-perform prediction piece number seven for the MCA's 25th birthday. Notably, this was the first time a performance from this series had been shown at the MCA. The work itself takes the form of a performance lecture performed by the artist in three parts. The artist first appears dressed as a man in a suit, then as an elegantly dressed woman, and then returns in another formal costume and red shoes. During each section of the performance, the artist reads a speech, the subject of which is predicting the future. This speech is repeated in each section of the performance. Much has changed since its original performance in 1984, and the curator and artist had to address a number of issues arising in the new context of the work. In 1984, the artist used a Dove computer when lining up the slides and audio for the performance. The MCA had since digitised these slides and Jones worked with uh, one of our um, staff members to programme the order and timing of the slides for her 2016 performance. The performance took place in the MCA's Veolia Lecture Theatre where the artist was now able to control the audio and visual el elements of her work from the lectern. This was important to the performance of the work and to the conceptual reasoning. The artist is female and it was essential that as a woman she be in control. While technology had developed in the intervening time, so had OHS regulations, preventing the firing of the status pistol used in the original performance within the enclosed space of the lecture theatre. So I think this was a, um, an attempt <laughs> to restage that. Um, additional issues relating to the restaging of the work were raised by the nature and age of the materials themselves. 
The curator, artist, conservator and registrar were all involved in discussions as to whether the clothing and shoes from the original work should be worn, and if they were, should they be cleaned after the performance, or would evidence of their use be retained as part of the work? The result that was that mostly the original props were used, though some of the costumes were uh, substituted. Um, so the acquisition of contemporary performance is complex, as we've seen. Um, works can be scripted, instructional and participatory, or may only be performed by the artist. These issues have much currency within collecting institutions and are the subject of much debate. Despite this, the acquisition of materials in the contemporary art archive facilitated the production of new work for the, for the MCA and allowed this collection to take the active role that Sue Kramer had so envisioned. Um, so looking back over the MCA's history, artist Jess Olivieri, alongside Grigor and Thompson, examined, interpreted and enacted documents from the MCA's archive. The artists undertook a four-day residency in the MCA library in which they spent time with objects from the archive and developed responses to them. For the performance on the 25th birthday weekend, the artists selected three objects from the archive, a video, artist file and exhibition catalogue. These objects were removed from their functional use. The video was not played, the catalogue not read and the archive file not opened. Rather, they existed as objects representative of the archive, symbols of the choices made of what to collect and what to preserve. They were no longer research material, but cultural artefacts. The work took place in, a, in an open seminar room adjacent to the museum's library. It was sparsely furnished with a few chairs for the audience, some of whom stayed for less than a minute while others stayed an hour or more. The objects were exhibited in a display vitrine and for the duration of the two-day performance, the public was invited to select an item for the artists who then performed their responses to each object. Engaging with the audience in this way allowed for multiple readings and reactions to the objects, all coexisting in the one space. So the responses composed by the artists were at times absurd, humorous and thoughtful. The durational nature of the performance meant that while audience members might be hearing the performance of a text for the first time, a performer might have recounted that same text numerous times to the point of monotony and absurdity. Exhibition invitations, posters, room brochures, photographs and correspondence are the records kept to form the official history of our exhibitions, public programs and events. Alongside catalogues, these items are often the only record of an exhibition and reveal the concerns of artists, curators, and the museum, and how these might have changed over time. In this work, Olivieri tested the scope for redefining and reinterpreting these often forgotten records and their accessibility. Alongside Grigor and Thompson, Olivieri explored the nature of the MCA's archive, questioning, interrogating, and playing with it. The artists brought the archive to life and interpreted interpreted it in a way that in which its keepers and creators could never have intended. This action retained the contemporaneity of the archive as well as drawing attention to its holdings. So there is no doubt that archives are a source of great imagination, informing the stories we tell ourselves, our histories and grand narratives. Allowing artists scope to examine and respond to archives is one way to encourage diversity in our collections, profession and audiences. The MCA works with artists at its heart, and this model has facilitated two interesting and complex works that investigate the ontology of archives. Performance is shown to be a particularly rich form to work from, allowing for multiple narratives and timelines to exist in the one space, and for interacting with archives in a non-linear way. Additionally, the Contemporary Art Archive presents an alternative model for archiving, negotiating issues of ephemerality and temporality. Sue Brekel writes that as humans, we project onto the archive our imaginings. With this in mind, who better to translate these ideas, encourage and embrace a plurality of perspectives than contemporary artists? Thank you. We actually, uh, Catherine Sheev was due to speak, and she's uh, not. 
uh, here, but her husband, uh, Dr Warren Burt, who's an associate lecturer at the Box Hill Institute, will be reading her part of the paper. And we're also joined by Liz Irving, who's the university archivist at La Trobe. Uh, Catherine herself is a researcher at the University of Divinity at uh, Melbourne University. So uh, if you could join me in welcoming, welcoming Warren and Liz to the stage. Thank you. Uh, I'll start off with Catherine's statement, and then we'll go to my statement, and then we'll go to Liz's statement, which is going to tell the story of uh, an archive of uh, a lot of material from a very important music department and the misadventures it's had over the years. Uh, so this is Catherine's statement. She says, in 2012, I consulted with, with the music department at Box Hill Institute to develop their Master of Music degree. As a degree developer, I was involved in setting the tone, philosophy, and structure of the degree. Working with the department head and staff, we agreed that Box Hill would undertake to develop a degree that has a broad interdisciplinary approach to contemporary music and that is based on a seminar format, encouraging musicians with technological, performance, and composition backgrounds to collaborate closely and think experimentally. Part of this development process was the creation of a large database of resources, and we also benchmarked our degree plans against existing degrees in Victoria and interstate. During the research process, it was pointed out to me that Box Hill was housing uh, the remnants of the curriculum documents and audio recordings from the now extinct and world famous former music department at La Trobe University, which existed from 1975 to 1999. Uh, I was very excited to hear this because as a music practitioner, I was aware that La Trobe had set the precedent in Australia for ambitious experimental world-class tertiary music education. In fact, I had participated in that program as a peripheral collaborator in the late 1980s. So I was curious to see what these materials might look like. They were stored in the back room of a library on Box Hill Nelson campus. Basically, someone had thrown them into banker's boxes and all the materials looked fairly musty and collaged together. I took all the curriculum materials, 26 binders, to Whitehorse campus for further examination toward the master's degree I was developing. I left behind the 300 audio tapes and numerous cassette tapes and DVC, or VHS videotapes. Those were later brought into the Whitehorse campus when the Nelson Library was closed, and which Nelson Library is about to reopen in about a week. Uh, as my particular interest, and the Whitehorse campus library will be shut. Uh, as my particular interest was in curriculum development, I had a close look at the 26 binders representing the history of the La Trobe music course. They are from the mid-1970s through the late 1990s when the department was closed. In terms of materials and ideas, the earliest binders from the mid-1970s to the early 1980s were the most interesting to me. These are hand-assembled, cut-and-paste, hand-drawn and hand-typed hand coursework master copies and scholarly materials. As we progress into the late 80s and 1990s, the curriculum gets a bit more standardized. What I saw during the initial look included, just as a few examples, an integrative approach to teaching music technology, history, and composition. For example, in one class, an examination of a medieval chant leads to theoretical analyses using creative means such as electronic music composition. The electronic analyses are treated as new original works in their own right. A snapshot of an exciting period in the development of music technology. The studio itself is a course subject which is constantly evolving from one semester to the next. One can see the writers of the curriculum are themselves working at the cutting edge, developing and testing new technologies with the students. An emphasis, uh, an emphasis on historical scholarship alongside creative output. This is highly unusual in music departments and reflects the leadership of the department's founders, Professor Keith Humble. The integration of the original scholarship of the faculty into the curriculum. I saw in passing one hand-typed monograph by Jeff Pressing stuck between the pages of a seminar outline. Jeff was an important jazz and new music scholar. A very high standard of music learning even at the beginner's undergraduate level. This was a demanding, rigorous, internationally-minded course and exposure to contemporary practice from all over the world. There is one binder containing the correspondence from international artists who visited La Trobe, who collaborated with Melbourne musicians, who gave concerts at La Trobe and in Melbourne, and who produced Australian music overseas. A commitment to music as research 
basically developing technologies, theoretical models, and creative structures as an essential driver of music making. This approach has become increasingly rare in recent years. And I can diverge from the prepared talk to say, when I was a faculty member at La Trobe in uh, 1980, the chairman called me into his office and said, Warren, your research is first rate. And I said, well, that's interesting because I only published one article. And he said, yes, but you've been doing concerts, community organizing, uh, radio shows, and he listed a whole bunch of things. And I went, yes. And he says, that's all legitimate research. I left academia for 20 years. I came back. None of that was considered legitimate research anymore. I don't know what happened in those 20 years, but something went wrong. A snapshot of a vital period in the history of contemporary music in Australia. In this archive, we see the work of, just to name a few, Keith Humble, Jeff Pressing, Laurie Whiffen, Warren Burt, John McCackey, and many others. The music department was meticulous about documenting the authors of all its curriculum. After this initial survey, I returned to look again at the La Trobe Music Department archive in 2016, this time as a student of information studies with an interest in archival practice. I did a more systematic survey of the entire collection, including the audio tapes. I created a rough documentation of the context of the curriculum binders, plus the apparent context only from print materials and tape boxes of the audio recordings. Some additional observations. Among the audio recordings are ABC master tapes of concerts in important Melbourne venues, for example, the Iwaki Auditorium. Our friend from ABC Archives may be interested in that. The department used recording technology so thoroughly that we have a detailed record not only of formal concerts, but also student works, visiting artists, electronic works, lecture audio recordings, and experiments with the recording process itself. The tapes are mostly in excellent condition. I flagged tapes that appeared to contain important materials. And then after the second visit to the archive, she uh, prepared spreadsheets, which Liz now has, uh, which document that, uh, document everything there. Uh, and uh, she created two spreadsheets, one for print, one for audio. The proportion of the, the portion of the archive that is now back at La Trobe, that was, at La Trobe, it was still at Box Hill when this was written, were 26 binders of printed material, curricula, concert programs, musical scores, listening lists, lab manuals, and written scholarship exams, etc. Much handwritten material used to run this world-renowned music program during its 24 years of operation. Most of the binders combine multiple years. Work of the entire La Trobe faculty and many of its students and visitors is documented here and then over 300 reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes, many of them master tapes of concerts, plus numerous cassette tapes, videotapes, and that, digital audio tapes stored in professional tape boxes, in-house published cassette series, professional masters by the ABC, masters for the La Trobe University curriculum listening lists, concerts by visiting artists, recorded lectures, etc. Many have concert programs included. There are so many audio materials that she only was able to notate the size and give an ID number to the last 250 out of the 284 audio items. Uh, and so then she asked me to uh, make some phone calls and track down the story of how the La Trobe archive actually came to be at Box Hill in the first place. And here's that story. The first part of the story is related to me by David Hurst, who was the last chair of the La Trobe University Music Department before it was shut down in 1999. The La Trobe Music Department opened its doors in 1975, founded by Keith Humble, and for 24 years was rated one of the best music departments in the country. It was shut down by La Trobe University in 1999 in yet another round of cost cutting. Uh, that year they shut down music, Spanish, Italian, linguistics, and environmental studies. Uh, so David's story. In the dying days of the La Trobe Music Department, 1998 to 99, David realized it would be important to preserve the documentation that the department had accumulated in its 24 years of existence. One project, done in collaboration with Robin Fox, student at La Trobe at the time, was to digitize a number of the recordings in the department archive. A selection was made and 10 CDs worth of recordings were digitized. These are currently held by David Hurst in his private archive. To preserve print documents and tape recordings, David negotiated with the university that an office would be allowed to store the papers and tapes. This office was actually Jim Sosnan, another faculty member's old office. 
David himself was given an office by the university for two years after the closure of the department to help with the shutting down procedure. The archive remained in that office for many years. David eventually left the employee of La Trobe University and worked at Melbourne University for several years. He then returned to La Trobe University in another capacity in the early to mid-2000s, and the office with the archive materials was still there with the archive materials still in it. The archive room was also used as a room with several servers in it. In 2010, David was approached by the Pro Vice, yep, David was approached by the Pro Vice Chancellor who was trying to trade off space with the humanities faculty. Administrative controversy about the space happened within the administration. They asked David what the material was. He told them, the Borchart Library at La Trobe University showed no interest whatever in acquiring the material for its collection. The humanities faculty said to David Hurst, quote, you can have this material, unquote. The pressure was on David to find a home for the material. He let his plight be known through the Australasian Computer Music Association mailing list. Uh, at Box Hill Institute, Tim Opie, La Trobe Music graduate and then faculty member at Box Hill, responded to David's request. He informed Peter Myers, who was another La Trobe Music graduate and then chairman of the Higher Education Music Department at Box Hill, about this. Peter arranged with the Box Hill Institute Music Library to have a space in the library storeroom at the Nelson campus at Box Hill Institute to store the material there. Not everything could be saved, David said. For example, all copies of the honor theses that had been generated by the Latrobe Music Department had to be thrown out. There was just no room for them. But he did manage to preserve all the folders of paper material and all the electronic media, tapes, video, videos, and cassettes. Peter Myers now picks up the story. In 2011 to 2012, Peter Myers and Tim Opie drove out to La Trobe University in two cars, and with David Hurst loaded all the material into the two cars and drove to the Nelson campus at Box Hill Institute and placed the material in there. The material remained in the Nelson storeroom for several years. In 2013, while developing the Master of Music Contemporary Practice degree for Box Hill Institute, Catherine Sheeve was given access to the folders of material. They were then moved up to a storeroom on the third floor of Building W1 at Whitehorse campus so she could have access to them while planning Box Hill's master's degree. In 2014, Box Hill was closing down the Nelson campus library. Mark Suarez, research librarian at Box Hill, informed me, former La Trobe University music faculty member and current Box Hill Institute faculty member, of this, and Mark and Warren went to the Nelson storeroom and inspected the electronic media. Warren and Mark agreed that the material needed to be preserved, and in 2014, the electronic media was moved to the same third floor storeroom built in building W1 at the Whitehorse campus. Uh, and it was placed in boxes with the name Warren Burt on them. Uh, the library didn't know how to uh, accession the material, so they said, basically, it's yours. Uh, in two th late 2016, Catherine Sheeve, while doing a library internship project for Charles Sturt University's Master's of Information Science degree, did a residency at the Box Hill Institute Music Library. As part of this, she made a list of the contents of the Latrobe Music Archive. David Hurst has said that he also kept a lot of materials from Latrobe University Music Department in his private archive at his holiday house in Torquay. Some of the materials are copies of all handbooks from the complete history of the La Trobe University Music Department, some recordings from his private archive during his years at the department, and a copy of the early version of the La Trobe University Music Department website. David was a student at La Trobe Music Department from 78 to 81 and later a faculty member and then department chairman. He has, he has stated that if a home for the La Trobe University Music Archive can be found, he would be willing to donate, donate his materials to that archive as well, creating a more complete uh, uh, portrait of the department. And uh, we were looking desperately because Whitehorse Campus at, at Box Hill has now been sold to real estate developers, and we have to be out of that place by October 27th. And uh, apparently the wrecking balls come in on the 5th of November. And uh, so I was desperate to find a place. Ross Bencina, composer who'd been associated with Latrobe, had said, if everything else fails, my pa parents' wine cellar will be available. Uh, however, at that point, I received a phone call from Liz Irving, uh, archivist at Latrobe University. And she had read the abstract of Catherine's paper and had been looking for these missing materials from the Box Hill Music Archive, or from the Latrobe Music Archives. Over a period of a couple months, we arranged for the materials to return to the Latrobe Archive, and this is where Liz picks up the story. Uh, 
Okay, so there we are. La Trobe University Archives, as Warren said, first became aware of the existence of the La Trobe Department music records held at the Box Hill Institute through the most unlikely of sources, which was the ASA conference program, which there, goes to prove you should always be a member. <laughs> uh, while reading the program, the abstract for Catherine's paper jumped out at me and I immediately set to action. It was quite literally the next thing I did. Uh, first contacting the ASA committee, committee, actually through their representative, Kirsten, who had been reviewing the papers as a part of the committee, um, to obtain the con contact details for Catherine, and then contacting the head librarian at the Box Hill Institute. The emergence of these records answered an ongoing question around the LTU Music Department collection, which was, surely there should have been more the LTU archives was missing the diversity that you would have expected from such a significant department, which had been operational for such an extended time period. The situation is one, as professionals, that is not unique or new to us. In my 25 years in the profession is one I've seen many times. In many cases, collections removed from agencies were never seen again, or the access and use had become so uncontrolled and unmanaged it had become impossible to return to the records to the state where they represent the agency or events which they documented. Such cases usually occur when there's an absence of an archives professional or team within the agency and said, or, said t university t sorry, or said individual or team is just not engaged. We are a diverse glamour community. Archivists are an important part of this diverse community, collecting and preserving the agency's identity over time. However, we must ensure that we are seen and heard, that we communicate the diversity and value of our collections and that we are present, not to be handed the remains of records when no one wants them, but to actively ensure that the collection reflects the agency and its many identities. None of the current records and archives team at La Trobe University were with the university when the LTU music department records were removed. In fact, my current manager started six months after the records were actually relocated to Box Hill Institute. We strive at the, in our team to be present in the life of our university, to act as witnesses to the growing and ongoing identity of the university and ensure that the collection reflects that identity over time. The LTU Music Department archive records that were housed at Box Hill Institute have been returned to the custody of the La Trobe University and are in the process of being reintegrated into the existing collection of the music department, which had not been removed from the LTU custody. And there are quite interesting tenules that we've been able to find, we're actually starting to bring them two together. So it's not actually two separate bodies now. We actually are still finding those links. It's actually been quite exciting within our team. We also now know, as Warren said, that the collection is still incomplete and the plan to liaise with those, particularly David, who have now the remaining records in their possession to continue to reintegrate the collection. This is a case of not of loss, or blame, but one of cooperation, preservation, and a small bit of luck. The most important outcome is that within the La Trobe University archives, the records of the La Trobe University Music Department will be preserved and managed for future access and use. Through the archives, the staff and students of the past will continue to perform on to the future. Thank you.